If you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to open up to at least three places, and this hopefully will make sense as we spend some time together this morning. But first and foremost, 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's one place that we'll find ourselves this morning. And then Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, and we always say that here in Northwest Florida, um, we'll make our way over to Hebrews chapter 4. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 4, and then also just for good measure, John chapter 5. You say, wait a second, it says Nehemiah. Yes, it does. And this is why we're looking at those three texts. One of the desires of our heart would be to navigate the Word of God through a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse method through the book of Nehemiah. And today is kind of the preview. Do you remember these things? You may not remember them. We used to have movie theaters that people used to go to. Remember those? Like 2019? Anyone remember back that long? Well... When you go to a movie theater, you would sit there and watch a preview of what's about to be released. Well, that's kind of what today is. It's a preview of the book of Nehemiah. Well, we're going to consider three simple questions. What, why, and how? We'll get into that in just a moment. But then Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, next Sunday we will go through chapter 1. Verse by verse. The following Sunday, maybe you can take a guess. Chapter two, yes. And then we'll just keep rocking and rolling. And Lord willing, throughout the winter and spring months, we plan to have three guest teachers here. Their names are Randy Pittman, Nathan Wagner, and Jim Gallagher. Now you may go, I don't, I don't know who those names are. That's okay. Jesus does. He likes them, you know, so you'll, hopefully you'll like them too. Um, but they'll be in the middle of that time frame between February and May 27th. That's kind of our time frame for navigating the book of Nehemiah together. And here's our hope. Our hope is that you will, in your own life, not only learn that Jesus is the hero of Scripture, and that Jesus is the focal point, but, but let me have your attention, let me see your eyes, that you will truly, in some way and in some measure, grow in this understanding that Jesus and Jesus alone is the one that ultimately rebuilds and restores. Now, that may not seem offensive, but it is. Because many of us have functional saviors that we look to at all times. And what this book will point to, specifically today, we'll see this today in a visual demonstration, that there is no one, no religious leader, no political leader, no one is Jesus other than Jesus, because Jesus is the one who gave it all. And therefore, Jesus is the one who is given the name above every other name. Everyone else, including the one speaking to you right now, will disappoint you. Everyone. So so don't deify someone, because then you, you will eventually demonize that individual. It's what we do to anyone that has an ability. We deify until we demonize. And I'm just saying, Jesus is our hero. Jesus is the flag we wave. His kingdom is home. And this book, Nehemiah, at least for me, as I've considered it a handful of times, shows me Jesus. Listen to what a few authors have said about this book. One author writes this. The book of Nehemiah is such a powerful lens in following the voice of God. Hearing from God and appropriately responding so that as God's timing, listen to this, as God's timing aligns with the person he desires to use and the things he desires to do, one finds him or herself effectively positioned to see God do something amazing. That's what Nehemiah shows us. Listen to what another author writes. He says this, the best leadership book I have ever read 
is the book of Nehemiah. I am blown away by the leadership lessons it contains. Long before Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, Fred Smith, Henry Ford, and we'll even throw the Texan in there, Elon Musk, right? Long before those guys, Nehemiah was someone who took on a project big enough to change the world, and though many thought he was crazy, that's exactly what happened. He changed the world. He took radical steps to live out the dream that God put in his heart, regardless of the cost or consequences, he never gave up. He looked at the world, listen to this, and didn't see what it was, he saw what it could be. And when he spoke of the future that he saw, others began to follow. Not because he had a great plan, even though he did, but because he had a great vision. He inspired people. He drew out the best in them, pushed them to be all that God had called them to be, and empowered them to do all that God had called them to do. In fact, I think his building up of people around him was potentially a greater accomplishment than the walls that he is remembered for building. It wasn't all roses and rewards for Nehemiah. It never is for those who will change the world. He knew full well the truth of this statement. If you want to lead, you must be willing to bleed. For he faced criticism, opposition, danger, and betrayal. And perhaps nothing caused him more pain than the prospect of his greatest accomplishment, the spiritual health of the people he loved, unraveling at the seams as they headed into an uncertain time. But no matter what he faced, he kept the vision God had given in front of him, center and in front, and refused to budge. Wow. I'll tell you something. As a guy that has five and a half kids, it's challenging just to get out the front door in the morning. I could be a little bit, I could learn some stuff from this guy. Like he, he's navigating stuff after he gets out the front door. So I, Nehemiah is a powerful book. And it's powerful in at least two ways. Listen, historically, for you Bible students, listen, this is what we learn in Nehemiah. We learn about the return of God's people, the nation of Israel, to Jerusalem from captivity. Now, in this book, Nehemiah, we'll see that it's in concert with this name. And let me see if any of you guys have this name. Zerubbabel. Any Zerubbabels in here? Well, that's a guy in the Bible. Zerubbabel led a group of God's people back to Jerusalem. Ezra also led a group of people back to Jerusalem. And we'll see that in this book, historically. Also historically, we see the restoration of the Jewish nation under Nehemiah's leadership. And thirdly, we're given clarity to the Messiah's lineage. I mean, how many of you guys have ever looked at the Bible before? Okay. In the Old Testament, there's these northern and southern tribes that are spoken of. And then when you get to Jesus' era, it's like, then there's these Samaritans. And what happened to the northern and southern tribes? Like, where, where did all this, what happened here? In this book, we will see how those northern and southern tribes become one. Doctrinally, or doctrinally, here's what you'll see in this book. God is faithful to his promises and plans for his people, despite the years of captivity. And despite, listen, 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 don't miss this. God was faithful even when they cried out. God was faithful even where they didn't want to go, where he was taking them. See? You ever done that? God was faithful. Listen to this. Listen to this. Don't miss this, American 21st century Christians. God was faithful despite who's in power. God is faithful despite who leads. God is faithful. And here's the other thing this shows us doctrinally. God uses the good, the bad, and the ugly for his good will. That's what it shows us. It highlights and accentuates that God is in charge, that he is creator, you and I are created. So chill out. It's going to be okay. 
Yes, there may be death. Yes, there may be sorrow. Yes, there may be loss. Yes, there must be pain. When were we ever promised any different? Did you know that the church in China prays that the American church would know persecution? You say, wait a second, I didn't hear what you just said. That we would not know it, right? No. For they have found persecution to be that which has given them clarity to that which really matters. That God is not concerned as much with your comfort as he is your character. That he's more concerned about your eternal destiny than your temporal vacation plans. That God is writing his story. And you and I are blessed to be a part of it. And this is the truth. This is what Nehemiah shows us. And I'll just say one last thing before we consider the what, why, and how. This book highlights doctrinally for us this great thing. That every believer needs to contribute. They're in a fight in the book of Nehemiah. People are out to kill them. Let me, let me just tell you something. Right now, you, they may not be yet after you physically, but somebody is after you emotionally and spiritually and financially. There is an enemy who would love to distract and diffuse your vision for what really matters. And he wants you to be a consumer because that's when you're miserable. But for some reason, we think that that's what we deserve. The customer is always right. So when I come to church, I'm the customer. I didn't know we had customers. I, I thought we had people. And some people partner, and some people just kind of hang out. But the Bible in here, it's going to talk to us about that every believer is called to contribute as God is leading them. As God, please listen to that qualifier. As God is leading them. Not some pastor. Not some business plan. The Spirit of God. But you are most miserable when you disobey Jesus. And Jesus said, anyone who wants to be great in my kingdom, your servant. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. These are Jesus' words. And I can just speak for myself in this scenario. I know what it's like to be miserable because of selfishness. I know what that's like. And I don't want to do that anymore. Selfishness is a ripoff, man. And unfortunately, we live in a culture that, that preaches that if you could just get the right status the right substance, the, the right situation, the right stuff, the right sex, then you'll be satisfied. No, you won't, man. Those things only gratify. There's nothing wrong with gratification, but if you live for gratification, you will miss out on what you're designed for, and you're designed for satisfaction of soul, not gratification of flesh. But satisfaction of soul comes through a savior, not through salary, status, sex, substance, situation, and stuff. That's a lot of S's right there. But it's true. But those are good things. But don't make them God things. For God things rob you of good things when you take a good thing and use it for that which it is not designed. There's joy in it. For a moment. But true satisfaction comes when you know what it's like to be loved by a creator, know what it's like to be connected to his people, and know what it's like to live on purpose for that which lasts. Those are all free. They're available to you. And this book will highlight how you can be a part of that. And this morning, here's my simple goal. I would like to accomplish three things. What, why, and how. You say, what do you mean by what? Well, what, what, what is this book all about? I mean, I've been in church for a minute, 
Like, I've been in some schools. I've read this book many times. I've read commentaries, dictionaries, lexicons. I've got this program called Logos or Logos, depending on what part of the country you live in. And it's got like all this plethora of information. Listen, there are literally books and sermons and outlines and classes to support our endeavor in learning about what Nehemiah is about. There's actually Bible apps. Have you heard of this Bible app called Dwell? Dwell is the Bible app that'll read the Bible to you in whichever translation you desire with different dialects. If you're like, you know what really makes me feel spiritual is that Australian voice. So let me get that Australian voice and let me get ambient music and then the Psalms. I mean, that's just holiness right there in a bottle, right? Like, okay, if that's your jam, go for it. That we have this all, we even, you know what else you have? You have a Bible. Like, you can read it and find out what Nehemiah is about. I believe it. God's Spirit speaks to his people. You can read the Bible and observe, interpret, and apply. And find, this is what the Bible, yes. It's not some, yes. If I can do it, trust me, you can do it. Yet for the time here this morning, here's what I'd like to do. And this is a bit of a front to my own preaching ministry, but this is what I'm going to say. I don't want to be the one to explain to you what this is about. Why? Because there's someone better. Say, really? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people better. But But there's this guy. And he lays it out visually and verbally, but visually. And when I saw this, I go, man, that really really helped me. I kind of see the bigger picture of what actually is Ezra and Nehemiah. They were written as one book, but not until the 1500s did they separate it. And this guy shows us a little bit of what this book is about visually. Now, historically, this book is awesome. Contextually, this book is awesome. And what I'm about to show you visually is awesome. But I I need to take a quick poll because i got to be honest with you. (sighs) This clip, it's, uh, it's not 10 minutes long. And it's not five minutes long. It's eight minutes long and a little bit of seconds. So, right side of the room, can you stay awake for eight and a half minutes and watch this? Back row, you even got to participate back there. Is that that okay? You can do a thumbs up. Okay, there's a thumbs up in the back. Okay. Left side of the room, even you guys over here, can you stay awake for eight and a half minutes and learn the Bible? Okay, back row. Okay, back row. Well... Let's see if you're true to your word. No, no, no. Let's just see. Let's check it out. We're going to run that video, and I really think this will help you. It sure helps me visually. So this has audio and visual. Ready, set, go. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In most modern Bibles, these books are separate, but that division happened long after it was written. It was originally a unified work written by a single author. The story is set after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and took many of the people into exile. And this book picks up about 50 years later and tells the return of some Israelites to Jerusalem and then what happened when they rebuilt the city and their lives there. Specifically, the book focuses on three key leaders who led the rebuilding efforts. You have Zerubbabel, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And the book's design focuses on the efforts of each leader. Zerubbabel leads a large group of people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then about 60 years later, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And then he's followed by Nehemiah, who leads the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. And these three stories are designed to be parallel. Each begins with the king of Persia prompted by God to send the leader to Jerusalem and he offers resources and support and then each leader encounters opposition in their efforts which they then overcome but in a way that leads to a strange anticlimax in each of the three parts. Let's back up and see how it fits together. So the story begins with a decree from Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he's moved by God to allow the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the author says this fulfills a promise made by the prophet Jeremiah that the exiles would one day return to Jerusalem. 
Now, this fulfillment should trigger our hopes in the many other prophetic promises that exile was not the end of the story. We have hope for a future messianic king from the line of David. We have hope for a rebuilt temple where God's presence will dwell with his people. Hope for God's kingdom to come over all the nations and bring his blessing, just like he promised Abraham. And so it's with all these hopes in mind that we read on into the story of Zerubbabel. His name means planted in Babylon. He represents the generation born in Babylonian captivity, and he leads a wave of Israelites returning to Jerusalem. After they settle there, they rebuild the altar for offering sacrifices and later the temple itself. The foundation laying ceremony and then the temple's final dedication, these are key moments. The past stories of the tabernacle and temple's dedication should be in our minds. This is when the fiery cloud of God's presence is supposed to descend. He's dwelling with his people and it doesn't happen. And so while some people are happy about this new temple, the elders who had seen the previous temple of Solomon, they cry out in grief. It is nothing like their glorious past or their hopes for the future. And it's right here that we get the first story of opposition, and it's very odd. So the grandchildren of the Israelites who were not taken into exile, they had been living in Jerusalem all along, they come to offer help with the temple rebuilding. And Zerubbabel refuses. He says, you have no part in our temple. And this, of course, generates a conflict which Zerubbabel overcomes, but it's very strange because the prophets had envisioned that the tribes of Israel would all come together along with all of the nations to participate in the worship of the God of Israel when the kingdom finally comes. So this is an anticlimactic moment to say the least. In the next section, we zoom forward about 60 years and we're introduced to Ezra. He's a leader among the exiled Israelites in Babylon. And he's a Torah scholar and a teacher. And so he gets appointed by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, to lead another wave of people back to Jerusalem. And Ezra wants to bring about spiritual and social renewal among the people. Our hopes are high. And again, we come to another anticlimactic moment in the story. Ezra learns that many of the exiled Israelites that had come back, they had married non-exiles who had been living around Jerusalem. Some of them were non-Israelites, and almost certainly some of them were. Ezra then appeals to the commands of the Torah that Israel was supposed to be holy and separate from the ancient Canaanites. And he then says that the people living around Jerusalem are like the Canaanites. They're going to corrupt the exiles. So Ezra offers a prayer of repentance, and it's very heartfelt. But then he rallies all the leaders and enacts this divorce decree that says all these marriages should be annulled, the women and children sent away. And then the decree is only partially carried out. We're given a list of some of the men who divorce their wives, the story is very strange for a number of reasons. First of all, God never commanded Ezra to do any of this. It was the leaders of Jerusalem who led Ezra to make the decree. Second, the contemporary prophet Malachi, he did say that the exile should care about purity, but he also said that God was opposed to divorce. And so the mixed results of the decree, this all fits into this pattern of a strange concluding anticlimax. Which leads us to the next section about Nehemiah. He's an Israelite official serving in the Persian government, and when he hears about the ruined state of Jerusalem's walls, he prays and then gets permission from the Persian king Artaxerxes to go and rebuild the walls. The king even gives them an armed escort and all these resources. So after arriving in Jerusalem, he begins the building project, and he too faces opposition from the people who had already been living around Jerusalem. Once again, we face a tension in the story. The contemporary prophet Zechariah said that the new Jerusalem of God's kingdom would be a city without walls, that God's presence would surround it, that people from all nations would come and join the covenant people. But Nehemiah seems to operate with the opposite vision. He informs the people surrounding Jerusalem that they have no part in Jerusalem. And this, of course, provokes them to hostility. And so while Nehemiah carries out his vision for the city with integrity and courage. They have to build the city with armed guards to protect them. We keep wondering, could this whole conflict have been handled differently? And this all leads to the conclusion of the book in two movements, first positive and then negative.
Ezra and Nehemiah combine forces to bring about a spiritual renewal among the people. They gather all the exiles together for a festival. They read and teach the Torah to all the people for seven days. And then they celebrate the ancient Feast of Tabernacles to remember God's faithfulness from the Exodus and the wilderness journeys. Then they offer a confession of their sins. They vow themselves to renew the covenant, follow all the commands of the Torah. And they finish with a great celebration over the temple, the walls of Jerusalem, and we're thinking this could be the turning point, but it's not. The book ends on a huge downer. Nehemiah tours around the city, and he finds that the people have not been fulfilling their covenant vows. So Zerubbabel's work is undone as he finds the temple being neglected and staffed by all these unqualified people. He then discovers that Ezra's work is being compromised. He finds everyone violating the Torah, people are working on the Sabbath, and even his own work on the walls is involved because people are setting up markets around the walls of Jerusalem and working on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah, he goes on a rampage. Page. He's beating people up, he's pulling out their hair, and he's yelling, obey the commands of the Torah. And his final words are a prayer that God would remember him, that at least he tried, and the book ends. I mean, it's very strange. But we've been prepared for it, right? These anticlimactic moments have been woven into the book's design intentionally. And so it raises the question, what on earth does this book contribute to the storyline of the Bible? Well, remember, the book started by raising our hopes in the prophetic promises about the Messiah, the temple, the kingdom of God, and then none of it happens. So even though Israel is now back in the land, their spiritual state seems unchanged from before the exile. And while Ezra and Nehemiah, they do their best, but their political and social reforms among the people don't address the core issues of their heart. So what the book is pointing out is the same need highlighted by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. What God's people need is a holistic transformation of their hearts if they're ever going to love and obey their God. And so the book ends on a downer, yes, but it forces you to keep reading on into the wisdom and prophetic books to find out what is God going to do to fulfill his great covenant promises. But for now, that's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay, so did you get all that? That'll be all on the test, right? Like, that's like 10 fire hydrants. You ever heard of like, oh, that's like drinking from a fire? That's like 10 fire hydrants right there, man. That guy is filled with a wealth of information and application. And you can Google or YouTube that called Read Scripture or The Bible Project, which has more resources available for children and teens and those kinds of things. Or if you have the Right Now Media uh, app that we make available for free, which is like Hulu or Netflix or Amazon Prime or Peacock or there's like all Disney Plus, like all, you know, streaming services. We have like a Bible one and that stuff's on there as well if you're interested. Or you might go, man, that was a good nap. Okay, God bless you. But um, come back. The what of the book is amazing. I mean, it's amazing what happens. Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. These guys are leaders. These guys are not like, yeah, those guys are like, no, these guys are awesome. Like they're willing to leave captivity and take God's people back into a land. And the temple needs to be rebuilt. The culture of the people needs to be centered upon God. And the walls need to be built. And those three men led those initiatives. But as we see, it's like every four years in America, right? Like, well, where are we? We're right where we're supposed to be. What do you mean? What we need is Jesus, man. Like the new heart. That's the problem. The problem. You know this. The heart of every problem is the problem of the what? Heart. Can anyone in this section defeat death? Bitterness. Jealousy. Strife. Anger. Substance abuse. Infidelity. Jesus can. So why don't we just listen to him? That's what this book points to, all 66 books of it. Hey, there's one guy. You know what I find interesting about the book of Nehemiah? Here's what I find. In Nehemiah and Ezra, everything is restored to God's people. The walls, the temple, the culture, except for one thing. There's no king on that throne anymore. And for those that had been around, they would have realized that. Hey, what's the deal? 
Where's our king? Where is he? And they went without for hundreds of years. And then this baby was born in Bethlehem. And he fulfilled all the messianic prophecies. But can I say this? He did not fit their political agenda. They wanted a deliverer from oppression. Physically, Roman government was there. And Jesus said, (laughs) I I see the end from the beginning. Rome is here for a moment. You need your heart released from the oppression of sin. The what of this book is amazing. But what about the why? Well, 2 Timothy 3, you guys there? Oh, nobody's there. 2 Timothy 3, how about this section? We'll break it down slowly. 2 Timothy 3, nobody's there. Okay, well, I'll read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, you know what this says? It says, all scripture is inspired by God and useful. You mean what you're doing right now is actually, <laughs> it's not Charlie Brown's parents? No. All scripture is inspired by God, breathed out from him, and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our life. It corrects us when we're wrong, and it teaches us to do what's right, and God uses it to prepare and equip his people for every good work. All scripture includes the book of Nehemiah. Can anyone agree that in this day and in this age, it's often difficult to discern the truthfulness and validity of information? It's a challenge. I believe the word of God has a place to help you spiritually discern truth from a lie. But the question is, how well do you know your sieve How well do you know your filter? How much time are you spending washing your mind and heart with the water of the word? Listen, there's challenges to be for sure of getting into God's word. We're trying to mitigate that. We're saying, listen, here's a a daily two, two, three minute video and a little reading plan to help you get into God's word daily. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. No other generation has ever had as much much access as the Bible to you. Did you know that some generations, the Bible was chained to the pulpit and written in a language that was not common so that the people couldn't understand it? And they hungered for it. You and I, we've got Bibles coming out of our ears. And yet we're one of the most biblically illiterate generations. Why? Because the heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. What do you hunger for? What lights you up? What gets you going? Is it a hobby? Look, hobbies are well and good. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But we need men who will stop to live for entertainment and start to live to train in God's word. We need women who love God and his word more than they do the ideal picture of a happy home and hearth. We need children that have parents that learn, I am here to train you, not to entertain you. We need students who learn, I'm not yet ready. I'm not developed yet, biologically. Let me trust the generation that's ahead of me. We need everybody falling in love with God because they've experienced new life. Because love is more powerful than law. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. And God wants your heart. He doesn't want you to do a checklist every day. Read, read the daily thing. So every time Neil says it, I don't have to listen to that guy. Like, it's done. Okay, I got baptized. I checked it off. Now what you need me to do? Okay, I'm in. I went to first steps. Now I'm at, no. No, 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 no. This isn't a list to like legalistically follow. 
These are like points in your journey to help you see that you're growing. You're doing it. It's meant to be encouraging. And here's the thing. This book is helpful, 2 Timothy chapter 3. But you know what else is crazy about this book? Hebrews chapter 4, it says that this book talks to you like this. Like when you open it, it begins to speak. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, the word of God is alive. The word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any, the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires, and nothing in all creation is hidden before God. This is what opens it up. And everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And listen to this. He is the one to whom you're accountable. Listen to me, American. You are accountable. It's not about whatever you think. It's not about you going and getting yours. Colossians chapter 3 says you died. The New Testament says that you were bought with a price. Galatians says it's no longer you who live. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. The epitome of being a Christian is having a Christocentric lifestyle, not an egocentric lifestyle. Let me be honest with you. You shouldn't care what I think. You should care what this says. And if what I say doesn't align with what this says, forget what I say. We must. Because this book is living. This book is helpful. And in John chapter 5, here's what's so amazing about this book. And let me say this respectfully as a guy that loves this book. Ooh, and this will be taken out of context, I know, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's not even about the book. You say, what do you mean? John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think in them that they'll give you eternal life, but scripture points to me. It is not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Bible. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he uses his inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God to reveal to you and I who he is. So listen to me. Let me have your eyes. So that you could become alive. So that you could enter into a real relationship with the creator of life. Not death. God did not take three nails on a cross for cold, dead religion. He wants blood-bought intimacy with you. Do you know what the word proskaneo is in the Greek? Proskuneo is a word that we see in the New Testament that is used to describe worship. And do you know what that word actually means? It means to turn and to kiss. I've got this little boy that lives in my home right now. His name is Leonidas Ulysses Stephen. And he lives up to that name. Like Leo actually growls at you when he's not, he goes, Rawr. like when he's not, like he speaks, but he's also, when he's not stoked, he growls. Like, and it's powerful. Like Leo is just like, he's, he's coming for you, you know, even as a two-year-old. He's tough. But you know what else I've found? When I'm tender with those who are tough, like Leonidas, you know what Leo loves to do? Because he's two, he loves to go everywhere with me. When I get in a car, he'll always go, Dad, me? Me? Like, are you taking me? And every day but Friday, I have to say, no, buddy, I can't take you with me right now. And he always goes, okay. But when Friday comes, he's like, me? Me? I go, yes. He goes, okay. And he comes and he just puts a big old kiss right here. And he says, love you. I think he's saying love you, but he says, love you. <laughs> and what is that? That's intimacy with a son and a father. And this is what God desires for your life. That my attitudes, beliefs, and choices, my attitudes and actions, they're a kiss. God, I love you, and you love me. And some of you have broken images of the word Father. And so for you, intimacy with the Father, it just it, it like pushes you away. It doesn't draw you in. Listen to me. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that you live in a world that's riddled by sin. 
I'm sorry that you live in a world that is not as it could be and should be. But with all that said, you must move on. You must let that go. And you must say and understand this, that a heavenly father is tough for you and tender with you, not the other way around. And that heavenly father who's tough, who the span of the galaxy is like his thumb to his pinky, says, come to me, all you who labor and heavy la- are heavy laden. Call me Papa. That's what he says. He says, I want to be your dad. And this is what you've been bought for. Love, life, connection, purpose. And you know why I love this book, the, the, the book of Nehemiah? Billy Graham. You ever, you ever heard of Billy? Okay, cool. Billy was a good guy. He's with Jesus. He says this. The Bible is the greatest document available for the human race. It needs to be opened, read, and believed. One survey indicated only 12% of people who said they believe the Bible actually read it every day, and 34% only read it once a week. And I like this phrase. I'm going to steal this from Billy. And 42% read it only once in a great while. Isn't that a great thing to say? Like, when when was the last time? Oh, in a great while. Like, what does that mean? Like, who knows? Who knows? But this book, What the Bible's All About, will help the reading and study of God's Word become interesting, challenging, and useful. And we recommend it to you. And you know what? This was a Bible college book for me. You know why I like it? Let me show you why I like it. It's got lots of pictures. I like books like that. Like when it looks, oh my gosh, I got to read all that book. And then I go, oh, oh, there we go. I like this book. Well, in this book... This book highlights for us how each book of the Bible portrays Jesus. And listen to what old Henrietta says about Jesus and the Bible. The Bible portrays Jesus as the Savior of the world. That's like, if you want to know what the Bible's about, that's what it's about. Genesis portrays Jesus as Creator God. Exodus, Jesus as Passover Lamb. Leviticus, Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. Numbers, Jesus as the lifted up one. Deuteronomy. Jesus is the true prophet. Joshua, Jesus as the captain of our salvation. Judges, Jesus as our ultimate deliverer. Ruth, Jesus as our kinsman redeemer. First and second Samuel, Jesus is our king. Kings and Chronicles, Jesus Christ is our king. It's like God says, you need to really get this one down. And then Ezra and Nehemiah, Jesus is our restorer restorer. Last two Sundays, we've heard two phenomenal messages about how God restores, how he rebuilds. He does it through his son, Jesus. He does it in concert with his people by his spirit through his word. This is why we're studying this book. Why? It's all about Jesus. And Jesus is the one who ultimately rebuilds and restores. And that's what we see in this book. And our town is without a bridge, so I thought that's that's a good theme. Restoration, rebuilding, we all want that, right? (laughs) Amen, yeah. We all could do with a little bit of restoration, physically, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Anyway, there's too many ways that we need it. Now how? This is where we'll end. How do we do this? I'd like to do it together. That's how I would like to do this. This is an old idiomatic phrase, but it's very true. Alone you can go fast. Man. I go a lot faster from A to B without five and a half kids, if that makes any sense. But you know what? Together you go far. Those kids will stand on my shoulders, Lord willing. They'll do so much more than I ever could. They're worth it. See, in our Sunday morning gatherings at 9 and 11 a.m., both on-site and online, Pastor John and I plan to navigate the book of Nehemiah in a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study with you in this winter and spring, starting on January 31st, which is today, with a preview, and May 23rd, which would be chapter 13. Well, 
that actually may be more of a review. Because here's my goal. My goal is that you would experience to a greater degree restoration and rebuilding in Jesus in your life. And I want to measure that from January to May. I want to hear what's God done in your life in the area of restoration, in the area of rebuilding. Maybe we'll have a bridge. I mean, that would be like a huge, like we'll take a video of that, say, look, we are praying for restoration. Now we can go to Pensacola. We could have a big party. We all go over to Target or something, you know, like, <laughs> like but that's what we're praying for, right? Like restoration and rebuilding. And I want to invite you to join us. How do you join us? This bracelet, let me tell you about Marco from Milan. What do you mean? Well, I, I moved to Destin in 2012, and so did Marco. I came from this long way away called Gulf Breeze, and he came from Milan. So we're very similar, Marco and I. And anyway, I started working at a church, and Marco started opening up a coffee shop. I'd go to a coffee shop. I'd see Marco, talk to him. You know why? He had the best latte around. Got to know Marco. And then Marco, I said, you know what, buddy? I need you to start opening up a half hour early. And he said, why? So, well, we have all these guys that come to your coffee shop at 7, because that's when you open it. But in my opinion, the day's like halfway over at 7 a.m. Like, I, we need you to be up earlier because these guys go to work. And, and to give them an hour of time of connection and Bible study and encouragement and prayer, would you open up at 6.30? And he said, sure. You know Why? Because of the relationship. Now, let me be honest with you. That wasn't the intent of relationship. The intent of relationship was, I liked Marco, and I liked those lattes. That was it. And then opportunity came. Oh, he said, yeah, you can host your Bible study here. Thank you, Marco. And the guys kept coming, and they're like, oh, we can't do this anymore. And like, why not? It's, it's not early enough. Oh, well, I know Marco. I'll ask Marco. <sighs> And if you go see Marco today, he'll probably have like 10 bands on his arm. And they say things like living water, new life in Jesus, Jesus is better. And uh, I saw Marco a few weeks ago and I went into his shop and he said, where have you been? Like I said, I say, hey, bro, I moved. Like I, don't, I can't come here anymore. And um, he said, well, where are the bracelets? He said, look at my Jesus is better. It's wearing off. Give me more bracelets. And I said, well, okay, here, whatever I've got, I'll give to you. You know, I gave him the bracelets. But let me tell you something. Marco's not a believer, but here's what he is. He says, I like that word, Jesus is better. And he said, and I really like you. I said, really, why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> but I like you. I was like, okay, well, how much is that lot? No, 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 no. But that, just teasing, just teasing. But I said, well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I said, well, um, Maybe the reason you like me is because I'm dead. I died, and it's no longer my life. It's, it's the life of Jesus. And any good you see in me is not really me, because I know me. Me needed to die. And so I did, and I try to stay dead daily, if that makes any sense. It doesn't always work, but I try. <laughs> Um, but I like this because Marco asks me about it. And then Marco said, got any stickers? Sure, we got lots of stickers. Put them up on the glass doors. They say Jesus is better. He let us put our bulletins on his little cork board. I could leave the Calvary Chapel magazines there. It was great. It became a beachhead for the gospel. And that's why this bracelet's here. Why? Number one, to remind you. Yes, I think I need reminding. I need it all the time. That's why I got all this stuff on myself, because like, oh, I need to be reminded. But it's also meant to be an invitation. And so maybe take one of these today. And if you go, you know, I need to know this. And if I meet a Marco, maybe he doesn't even know Jesus. Did you just know that in 32563, according to the stat we read, there's 24,000 people. I don't know if that's real. That seems like a lot of people. But that means like before I hit National Seashore and before I hit, like, what's that? Holly by the Sea? That's a lot of people. And I like all you guys, but there's not 24,000 of you. Like, this is what I'm trying to say. 
you don't have to go very far to meet somebody who could hear the message that, hey, Jesus rebuilds and restores, and it may take root. If you can't live on mission here, why should you ever go there? Makes no sense. People need to see Jesus. You are the missionary that's leaving today for whatever zip code you're in. I'm in 32563. That's, what I'm, that's where I am. Um, and so are you right now, but just in case. But anyway, wherever you're going next. God wants to use you. And I want to invite you to step into that. Secondarily, and lastly, and I'm going to go invite the worship team up now because we're going to close down. In two platforms a week, I'm going to ask you to join us. How? You're already doing one of them. A Sunday morning gathering. When we're here on Sunday morning, there's 10 things I'm hoping that you're engaged in. The gospel, that when we have baptism, we celebrate it together, that we worship in song and in life, that we spend time in prayer, that we learn and live the Bible, that when we have it, we receive communion respectfully. It's not just a cool new cup with a bottom and a top lid and the wafer doesn't taste as bad. It's, it's more than that. Like It's like, this is, this is representing to me, this is symbolic to me of what Jesus did. Like I, I value this. I value community. I actually give. And listen to me, I serve. Man, the most miserable I've ever been is when I was a selfish Christian, which is an oxymoron, but like, I've met people like that. I don't know if you ever have, but like, and I've found that serving diffuses selfishness. Giving diffuses materialism. God doesn't need your money and he doesn't need your time. He's God. Like, he kind of created the Grand Canyon. You think he needs you? He doesn't need you, but he wants you. This is what's so great about God. He wants you in concert with him, in collaboration with him, in participation with him. And where you give, where you serve, where you live, that's what you believe. And that's what you're going after. These values that we wrote down, it's not like I get a check from Brian Broderson at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa for, we got 10 people in Connect Group, here's another $100. Like, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, we get nothing. You know? <laughs> Connect Group is for you. Worship gathering is for you to be able to be focused on him. So two platforms, a gathering and a group. I think it's just an opinion that if you've experienced new life in Jesus and the problem of sin and death is solved at the cross, It's then your responsibility in concert with the Holy Spirit to pursue spiritual health. And the way you do that is through three ways a week. Daily, you become a servant leader. We can train you to do that. Weekly, you're in a group where you're in community. And then on the weekend, you're in a worship gathering where it's about God and not about your felt needs. A gathering, a group, and a daily. That's why this is here to help. It is our responsibility, I believe, as pastors to help daily, midweek, and weekend. But let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. You will stand before the Lord. There's no mediator between God and man. It's your life. You're responsible for it. Steward it well, because it goes by so fast. And I know you may be in a season where you say, well, when this situation settles, the dust never settles. It's always something. So when are you going to start living the Bible? When are you going to start singing? When are you going to start praying, giving or serving or celebrating the gospel as people get baptized? If not now, when? When? I'll tell you when, never. That's when. Because today is always the day. It's always the day of response. And you should be listening to the Spirit of God, not me. Let the Spirit of God lead you season by season. Because some seasons, I'll be honest, with five and a half kids, you go, hey, we're here, and that's all we got. You know, like, in some seasons, like, hey, I got some time. What, What can I do? Navigate life in chapters and seasons. 
But keep those values, keep that mission, keep that vision strong. Because it's the best thing for you. Take a band, continue to come to gatherings, be in a group. Because I think as you do those things, spiritual health isn't gained in a day. It's through a lifetime. But I am so thankful, and I don't know if you are, that maintaining spiritual health doesn't earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift. It's justification. (laughs) God does that. And he's the one who sanctifies you as you just kind of make yourself available to him daily, weekday, and weekend. And at the end of the day, here's what we want for you. Pastor John, myself, Pastor Joe, everybody. We just want you to be stoked in Jesus. That's what we want. We want you to experience new life. We want you to be in love with God. We want you to be connected together and living on the mission that God has for you. That's our heart. That's rooted in the gospel, the great commandment, and the great commission. And we feel like this Calvary Chapel Association that we've had since 1983, for us, is good for us. It helps keep us theologically in a camp that we feel is solid. It help keep, helps keep us relationally in a group that is solid. And it helps us philosophically stay in a group that's solid. You say, what are you talking about? Come to first steps and you'll find out. But not tonight because it's full and you can't come. But you can come on April 11th. But sorry, we just got no more space. We got too many people. That's a good problem, right? Too many people want to follow Jesus. I think it's a good problem. But I hope and pray that Nehemiah will be as helpful to you as as it's been to me. That Jesus will restore and rebuild in your life as you are in gatherings, as you're in groups, and as daily you're in the Word. Because God loves you. And He is so, if I could say this, in Jesus. He's proud of you. He believes in you. God loves you. Keep your head up. Everyone's got seeds of fruitfulness and failure in them. Forget the past. Enjoy the moment. And let God take care of the future. Because as you and I both know, a plan in January may look very different in March. Right, 2020? Yeah. You got no idea what's coming for you other than God. 